From the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Sunday afternoon session of the 193rd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Sunday afternoon session of the 193rd semi-annual general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We extend our greetings to members of the church and friends everywhere who are participating in these proceedings by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. The music for this session will be provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square under the direction of Mac Wilberg, Ryan Murphy, with Richard Elliott and Brian Mathias at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing for all the saints. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Michael A. Dunn of the 70.
glorious Father in heaven, with effulgent joy and rejoicing, we present ourselves before thee at this concluding session of this marvelous general conference. How grateful we are, Father, for the many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God, which has been taught to us by thine anointed oracles and other leaders of this church. We're grateful to feel new resolve and hope as we go forward to be better disciples of thy son, our savior, the Prince of life and the Prince of peace, even Jesus the Christ. We so love him and so implore thy help to be with us that we may be more like him. We're grateful also to be enlisted in this greatest of all causes, the gathering of Israel, and pray that thou will steal us, Father, and help and bless us, that we might have more urgency around that important and sacred cause. Now, as we convene at this time for this session, we pray that thy blessings will be upon this proceeding. We pray especially for those without hope who are in despair or lost or in any way troubled that through words and music and most of all through thine Holy Spirit that they may be lifted and brought forward and continue on their covenant pathway. We love thee so much and are so grateful for the opportunity to be gathered here today and this is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We will now be pleased to hear from Elder Dale G. Renland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elder John C. Pingree, Jr. of the Seventy. Following Elder Pingree's remarks, the choir will sing, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. Elders Valerie V. Cordon and J. Kimo Esplin of the 70 will then address us. In 1907, a wealthy Englishman named George Herbert, the fifth Earl of Canavan, moved to Egypt and took up an interest in archaeology. He approached a well-known Egyptologist, Howard Carter, and proposed a partnership. Carter would oversee their archaeological excavations, and Conifon would provide the funding. Together, they successfully explored a variety of locations. Then they received permission to excavate in the Valley of the Kings, located near modern-day Luxor, where the tombs of many pharaohs had been found. They decided to look for the tomb of King Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun had ascended to the throne of Egypt more than 3,000 years earlier and reigned for 10 years before his unexpected death. He was known to have been buried in the Valley of the Kings but the location of his tomb was unknown. Carter and Conifon spent five years unsuccessfully searching for Tutankhamun's tomb. Eventually, Conifon informed Carter that he was finished with the fruitless quest. Carter pleaded for just one more season of excavation, and Conifon relented and agreed to the funding. Carter realized that the entire floor of the Valley of the Kings had been methodically excavated, except the area of their own base camp. Within a few days of digging there, they found the first steps leading down to the tomb. When Carter eventually peered into the antechamber of Tutankhamun's tomb, he saw gold everywhere. After three months, of cataloging the contents of the antechamber. They opened the sealed burial chamber in February 1923, 100 years ago. This was the most famous archaeological find of the 20th century. During those years of ineffectual searching, Carter and Conifon had overlooked what was literally under their feet. Some five centuries before the Savior's birth, the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob referred to taking for granted or undervaluing what's nearby as looking beyond the mark. Jacob foresaw that the people of Jerusalem wouldn't recognize the promised Messiah when he came. 
Jacob prophesied that they would be a people who despised the words of plainness and would seek for things they could not understand. Wherefore, because of their blindness, which blindness would come by looking beyond the mark, they must needs fall. In other words, they would stumble. Jacob's prediction proved accurate. During Jesus' mortal ministry, many looked beyond the mark, beyond him. They looked past the Savior of the world. Instead of recognizing his role in fulfilling Heavenly Father's plan, they condemned and crucified him. They looked and waited for someone else to bring them salvation. Like those people in Jerusalem and like Carter and Conifon, we too can be prone to look beyond the mark. We need to guard against this tendency lest we miss Jesus Christ in our lives and fail to recognize the many blessings He offers us. We need Him. We're counseled to rely wholly upon the merits of Him who is mighty to save. He is our mark. If we incorrectly imagine that there is a need for something beyond what He offers, we deny or diminish the scope and power He can have in our lives. He has claimed the rights of mercy and extends that mercy to us. He is the ultimate source to whom we should look for a remission of our sins. He is our advocate with the Father and champions what the Father has wanted all along for us to return to Him as inheritors in His kingdom. We need to, in the words of the prophet Alma, cast about our eyes and begin to believe in the Son of God, that He will come to redeem His people, and that He shall suffer and die to atone for our sins, and that He shall rise again from the dead, which shall bring to pass the resurrection. Jesus Christ is our treasure. The Savior has given us many ways to focus on Him intentionally, including the daily opportunity to repent. Sometimes we undervalue how great this offered blessing is. When I was eight years old, I was baptized by my father. Afterwards, I held his hand as we were going to cross a busy street. I wasn't paying attention and stepped from the curb just as a big truck came rumbling by. My father jerked me back out of the street and onto the curb. Had he not done so, I'd have been hit by the truck. Knowing my own mischievous nature, I thought, maybe it would have been better for me to be killed by the truck because I'll never be as clean as I am now right after my baptism. <laughs> as an eight-year-old, I had mistakenly presumed that the water of baptism washed away sins. Not so. In the years since my baptism, I have learned that sins are cleansed by the power of Jesus Christ through His atoning sacrifice as we make and keep the baptismal covenant. Then, through the gift of repentance, we can remain clean. I have also learned that this sacrament brings a powerful, virtuous cycle into our lives, enabling us to retain a remission of our sins. Just like the treasure that was under the feet of Carner and Conavon, the treasured blessings of the sacrament are available to us each time we attend sacrament meeting. We are promised that the Holy Ghost will be our constant companion if we approach the sacrament the way a new convert approaches baptism and confirmation, with a broken heart and contrite spirit and a determination to live up to that baptismal covenant. The Holy Ghost blesses us with His sanctifying power so that we can always retain a remission of our sins week in and week out. Our spiritual foundation is strengthened through repentance and by conscientiously preparing for and worthily partaking of the sacrament. Only with a robust spiritual foundation can we handle the metaphorical rain, wind, and floods that confront us in our lives. Conversely, our spiritual foundation is weakened when we voluntarily skip sacrament meeting or when we don't focus on the Savior during the sacrament. 
we may unintentionally withdraw ourselves from the Spirit of the Lord, that it may have no place in us to guide us in wisdom's path that we may be blessed, prospered, and preserved. When we have the Holy Ghost with us, we'll be inspired and guided to make and keep other covenants, such as those we make in temples. Doing so deepens our relationship with God. You may have noticed that many new temples have been announced in recent years, bringing temples ever closer to members. Paradoxically, as temples become more accessible, it may be easier for us to become more casual about temple attendance. When temples are distant, we plan our time and resources to travel to the temple to worship there. We prioritize these journeys. With a temple close at hand, it can be easy to let little things get in the way of attending, saying to ourselves, well, I'll just go another time. Living close to a temple does bring greater flexibility in scheduling time in the temple, but that very flexibility can make it easier to take the temple for granted. When we do, we miss the mark, undervaluing the opportunity to draw closer to the Savior in His holy house. Our commitment to attend should be at least as strong when the temple is nearby as when it's distant. After Carter and Conifon excavated elsewhere in the Valley of the Kings looking for Tutankhamun's tomb, they realized their oversight. We don't need to labor unsuccessfully, as they did for a time, to find our treasure. Nor need we seek counsel from exotic sources, prizing the novelty of the source and thinking such counsel will be more enlightened than that which we can receive from a humble prophet of God. As recorded in the Old Testament, when Naaman sought a cure for his leprosy, he was indignant at being asked to dip himself seven times in a nearby ordinary river. But he was persuaded to follow the prophet Elisha's counsel rather than rely on his own preconceived notions of how the miracle should occur. As a result, Naaman was healed. When we trust God's prophet on the earth today and act on his counsel, we will find happiness, and we too can be healed. We need to look no further. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to remember and always focus on Jesus Christ. He's our Savior and Redeemer, the mark to whom we should look and our greatest treasure. As you come to Him, you'll be rewarded with strength to face life's challenges, courage to do what's right, and the ability to fulfill your mission in mortality. Treasure the opportunity to repent, the privilege of partaking of the sacrament, the blessing of making and keeping temple covenants, the delight of worshiping in the temple, and the joy of having a living prophet. I bear my solemn and sure witness that God, the Eternal Father, is our Heavenly Father and that He lives. Jesus is the Christ. He's our kind, wise, heavenly friend, and this is His restored Church. Thank you for your faith and faithfulness. I pray that you'll be blessed, prospered, and preserved. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Elder Enlund, for your beautiful message. Brothers and sisters, thank you for your devotion to God, the Father, and to His Son, Jesus Christ, and thank you for your love and service to each other. You truly are remarkable. Many years ago, after receiving a call to serve as full-time mission leaders, our family determined to learn each missionary's name before arriving in the field. 
We obtained photos, created flashcards, and began studying faces and memorizing names. Once we arrived, we held introductory conferences with the missionaries. As we mingled, I overheard our nine-year-old son. Nice to meet you, Sam. Rachel, where are you from? <laughs> wow, David, you are tall. Alarmed, I went to our son and whispered, hey, let's remember to refer to the missionaries as elder or sister. He gave me a puzzled look and said, Dad, I thought we were supposed to memorize their names. Our son did what he thought was right based on his understanding. So what is our understanding of truth in today's world? We are constantly bombarded with strong opinions, biased reporting, and incomplete data. At the same time, the volume and sources of this information are proliferating. Our need to recognize truth has never been more important. Truth is critical for us to establish and strengthen our relationship with God, find peace and joy, and reach our divine potential. Today, let's consider the following questions. What is truth and why is it important? How do we find truth? And when we find truth, how can we share it? The Lord has taught us in Scripture that truth is knowledge of things as they are, as they were, and as they are to come. It was not created or made and has no end. Truth is absolute, fixed, and immutable. In other words, truth is eternal. Truth helps us avoid deception, discern good from evil, receive protection, and find comfort and healing. Truth can also guide our actions, make us free, sanctify us, and lead us to eternal life. God reveals eternal truth to us through a network of revelatory relationships involving Himself, Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, prophets, and us. Let's discuss the distinct yet interconnected roles each participant plays in this process. First, God is the source of eternal truth. He and His Son, Jesus Christ, have a perfect understanding of truth and always act in harmony with true principles and laws. This power allows them to create and govern worlds, as well as to love, guide, and nurture each one of us perfectly. They want us to understand and apply truth so we can enjoy the blessings they do. They may impart truth in person or more typically through messengers such as the Holy Ghost, angels, or living prophets. Second, the Holy Ghost testifies of all truth. He reveals truths to us directly and witnesses of truth taught by others. Impressions, come from the Spirit, impressions from the Spirit typically come as thoughts to our minds or feelings to our hearts. Third, prophets receive truth from God and share that truth with us. We learn the truth from past prophets in the scriptures and from living prophets at general conference and through other official channels. Finally, you and I play a crucial role in this process. God expects us to seek, recognize, and act on truth. Our ability to receive and apply truth is dependent on the strength of our relationship with the Father and the Son, our responsiveness to the influence of the Holy Ghost, and our alignment with Latter-day Prophets. We need to remember that Satan works to keep us from truth. He knows that without truth, we cannot gain eternal life. He weaves strands of truth with worldly philosophies to confuse us and distract us from what is communicated by God. As we seek eternal truth, the following two questions can help us recognize whether a concept comes from God or from another source. First, is the concept taught consistently in the scriptures and by living prophets? And second, is the concept confirmed by the witness of the Holy Ghost? God reveals doctrinal truths through prophets, and the Holy Ghost confirms those truths to us and helps us apply them. We must seek and be prepared to receive these spiritual impressions when they come. We're most receptive to the witness of the Spirit when we are humble, pray sincerely and study God's words, and keep His commandments. Once the Holy Ghost confirms a specific truth to us, our understanding deepens as we put that principle into practice. Over time, as we consistently live the principle, we gain a sure knowledge of that truth. For example, I've made mistakes and felt remorse for poor choices. 
but through prayer, study, and faith in Jesus Christ, I received a witness of the principle of repentance. As I continued to repent, my understanding of repentance grew stronger. I felt closer to God and His Son. I now know that sin can be forgiven through Jesus Christ because I experienced the blessings of repentance each day. So what should we do when we sincerely seek for a truth not yet revealed? I have empathy for those of us who yearn for answers that do not seem to come. To Joseph Smith, the Lord counseled, hold your peace until I shall see fit to make all things known concerning the matter. And to Emma Smith, he explained, murmur not because of the things which thou hast not seen, for they're withheld from thee and from the world, which is wisdom in me in a time to come. I too have sought answers to heartfelt questions. Many answers have come, some have not. As we hold on, trusting God's wisdom and love, keeping His commandments, and relying on what we do know, He helps us find peace until He reveals the truth of all things. When seeking truth, it helps to understand the difference between doctrine and policy. Doctrine refers to eternal truths, such as the nature of the Godhead, the plan of salvation, and Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice. Policy is the application of doctrine based on current circumstances. Policy helps us administer the Church in an orderly way. While doctrine never changes, policy adjusts from time to time. The Lord works through His prophets to uphold His doctrine and to modify Church policies according to the needs of His children. Unfortunately, we sometimes confuse policy with doctrine. If we do not understand the difference, we risk becoming disillusioned when policies change, causing some to question God's wisdom or the revelatory role of prophets. When we obtain truth from God, He encourages us to share that knowledge with others. We do this when we teach a class, guide a child, or discuss gospel truths with a friend. Our aim is to teach truth in a way that invites the converting power of the Holy Ghost. Let me share some simple invitations from the Lord and His prophets that can help. Center on Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, and their fundamental doctrine. Stay grounded in the scriptures and the teachings of the Latter-day Prophets. Rely on doctrine established through multiple authoritative witnesses. Avoid speculation, personal opinions, or worldly ideas. Teach a point of doctrine within the context of related gospel truths. Use teaching methods that invite the influence of the Spirit. Communicate clearly to avoid misunderstanding. Now, how we teach truth really matters. Paul encouraged us to speak the truth in love. Truth has the best chance of blessing another when conveyed with Christ-like love. Truth taught without love can cause feelings of judgment, discouragement, and loneliness. It often leads to resentment and division, even conflict. On the other hand, love without truth is hollow and lacks the promise of growth. Both truth and love are essential for our spiritual development. Truth provides the doctrine, principles, and laws necessary to gain eternal life, while love engenders the motivation needed to embrace and act upon what is true. I am forever grateful for others who patiently taught me eternal truth with love. In conclusion, let me share eternal truths that have become an anchor to my soul. I have come to know these truths by following the principles discussed today. I know that God is our Heavenly Father. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, and perfectly loving. He created a plan for us to gain eternal life and to become like Him. As part of that plan, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to help us. Jesus taught us to do the Father's will and to love one another. He atoned for our sins and gave up His life on the cross. He arose from the dead after three days. Through Christ and His grace, we will be resurrected. We can be forgiven, and we can find strength in affliction. During His earthly ministry, Jesus established His Church. Over time, that Church was changed and truths were lost. Jesus restored His Church and the truths of the gospel through the prophet Joseph Smith. And today, Christ continues to lead His Church through living prophets and apostles. I know that as we come unto Christ, we can eventually be perfected in Him, obtain a fullness of joy, and receive all the Father hath. To these eternal truths I bear witness in the holy name of Jesus Christ. 
Amen. Have you ever held a newborn in your arms? There is a light that emanates from every newborn, bringing a special bond of love that can fill their parents' hearts with joy. A Mexican writer wrote, I have learned that when a newborn first squeezes his father's finger in his tiny fist, he has caught him forever. Parenting is one of life's most extraordinary experiences. Parents enter a partnership with their Heavenly Father to guide their precious children back to heaven. Today, I would like to share some parenting lessons found in the scriptures 
and taught by living prophets to help us live our parental legacy. We must climb to higher ground of gospel culture in our families. President Russell M. Nelson declared, families deserve guidance from heaven. Parents cannot counsel children adequately from personal experience, fear, or sympathy. Although our cultural backgrounds, parenting styles, and personal experiences may be valuable for parenting, these abilities are insufficient to help our children return to heaven. We need access to a more elevated set of values and practices, a culture of both love and expectations, where we interact with our children in a higher, holier way. President Dallin H. Oaks described gospel culture as, quote, a distinctive way of life, a set of values and expectations and practices. This gospel culture comes from the plan of salvation, the commandments of God and the teachings of living prophets. It guides us in the way we raise our families and live our individual lives." End of quote. Jesus Christ is the center of this gospel culture. Adopting the gospel culture in our families is critical to creating a fertile environment where the seed of faith may flourish. To climb to higher ground, President Oaks invited us, quote, to give up any personal or family traditions or practices that are contrary to the teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ, end of quote. Parents, timidity in our part to establish gospel culture may allow the other side to establish a foothold in our homes, or even worse, in the hearts of our children. As we choose to make the gospel culture the predominant culture in our family, then, by the powerful influence of the Holy Ghost, our current parenting styles, traditions, and practices will be sifted, aligned, refined, and enhanced. President Russell M. Nelson has taught that the home should be the center of gospel learning. The purpose of gospel learning is to deepen our conversion to Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ and help us become more like them. Let's consider three crucial parenting responsibilities described by prophets and apostles that can help us establish a higher gospel culture in our homes. First, teach freely. Heavenly Father instructed Adam concerning Jesus Christ and his doctrine. He taught him to teach these things freely unto his children. In other words, Heavenly Father taught Adam to teach these things liberally, generously, and without restraint. The scriptures tell us that Adam and Eve blessed the name of God, and they made all things known unto their sons and their daughters. We teach our children generously when we spend meaningful time with them. We teach without restraint when discussing sensitive topics such as screen time, using resources that the church has made available. We teach liberally when we study the scriptures with our children using come, follow me, and allow the spirit to be the teacher. Second, model discipleship. In the book of John, we read when several Jews questioned the Savior about his conduct, Jesus directed attention to his model, his father. He taught, the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. Parents, what do we need to model for our children? Discipleship. As parents, we can teach the importance of putting God first when we discuss the first commandment, but we model it when we set aside worldly distractions and keep the Sabbath day holy every week. We can teach the importance of temple covenants when we speak about the doctrine of celestial marriage, but we model it when we honor our covenants, treating our spouse with dignity. Third, invite to act. Faith in Jesus Christ should be the core of our children's testimonies and these testimonies must come to each child through individual revelation. 
to assist our children with the building of their testimonies, we encourage them to use their agency to choose what is right and prepare them for a lifetime of God's covenant path. It will be wise to encourage each of our children to accept President Nelson's invitation to take charge of his or her own testimony of Jesus Christ and his gospel, to work for it, to nurture it so that it will grow, to feed it truth, and to not pollute it with false philosophies of unbelieving men and women. Our Heavenly Father's divine intentions as a parent were made known in a revelation given to Moses. For behold, this is of my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of men. President Nelson has added, quote, God will do everything he can short of violating your agency to help you not miss out on the greatest blessings in all eternity, end of quote. As parents, we are God's agents in the care of our children. We must do everything we can to create an environment where our children can feel his divine influence. Heavenly Father never intended for us as parents to sit on the silence as spectators watching the spiritual lives of our children unfold. Let me illustrate this idea of intentional parenting with a personal experience. When I was attending primary in a small branch in Guatemala, my parents began to teach me about the value of patriarchal blessings. My mother took the time to share her experience receiving her treasured patriarchal blessing. She taught me the doctrine related to patriarchal blessings, and she testified of, of promised blessings. Her intentional parenting inspired me to have the desire to receive my patriarchal blessing. When I was 12, my parents helped me navigate the search for a patriarch. This was necessary because there was no patriarch in the district where we lived. I traveled to a patriarch that was in a stake 156 kilometers away. I distinctly remember when the patriarch laid his hands upon my head to bless me. I knew by powerful spiritual confirmation, without a doubt, that my heavenly father knew me. For a 12-year-old boy from a small town, that meant everything to me. My heart turned to my heavenly father that day because of my mother and father's intentional parenting and I will be forever grateful to them. Sister Joy D. Jones, former primary general president, taught, quote, we cannot wait for conversion to simply happen to our children. Accidental conversion is not a principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ, end of quote. Our love and inspired invitation can make a difference in how our children use their agency. President Nelson emphasized, quote, no other work transcends that of righteous, intentional parenting, end of quote. Parents, this world is full of philosophies, cultures, and ideas competing for our children's attention. The great and spacious building advertises its membership daily using the most current media channels. But in the gift of his son, the prophet Moroni taught, hath God prepared a more excellent way. As we partner with God through covenants and become his agents in the care of our children, he will sanctify our intentions, inspire our teachings, and temper our invitations so our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. In the 1960s, my father taught at the Church College of Hawaii in Laia, where I was born. My seven older sisters insisted my parents name me Kimo, a Hawaiian name. We lived near the Laia Hawaii Temple when it served much of the church membership in the Asia Pacific area, including Japan. At this time, groups of Japanese saints began coming to Hawaii to receive the blessings of the temple. 
One of these members was a sister from the beautiful island of Okinawa. The story of her journey to the Hawaii temple is really remarkable. Two decades earlier, she had been married in a traditional arranged Buddhist wedding. Just a few months later, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, thrusting the United States into a conflict with Japan. In the wake of battles such as Midway and Iwo Jima, the tides of war pushed the Japanese forces back to the shores of her island home, Okinawa, the last line of defense standing against the Allied forces before the heartlands of Japan. For a harrowing three months in 1945, the Battle of Okinawa raged. A flotilla of 1,300 American warships encircled and bombarded the island. Military and civilian casualties were enormous. Today, a solemn monument in Okinawa lists more than 240,000 known names of people who perished in the battle. In a desperate attempt to escape the onslaught, this Okinawan woman and her husband and their two small children sought refuge in a mountain cave. They endured unspeakable misery through the ensuing weeks and months. One desperate night amidst the battle, with her family near starvation and her husband unconscious, she contemplated ending their suffering with a hand grenade, which the authorities had supplied to her and others for that purpose. However, as she prepared to do so, a profoundly spiritual experience unfolded that gave her a tangible sense of the reality of God and his love for her, which gave her the strength to carry on. In the following days, she revived her husband and fed her family with weeds, honey from a wild beehive, and creatures caught in a nearby stream. Remarkably, they endured six months in the cave until local villagers informed them that the battle had ended. When the family returned home and began rebuilding their lives, this Japanese woman started searching for answers about God. She gradually kindled a belief in Jesus Christ and the need to be baptized. However, she was concerned about her loved ones who had died without a knowledge of Jesus Christ, including her mother who died giving birth to her. Imagine her joy when two sister missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints came to her house one day and taught her that people can learn about Jesus Christ in the spirit world. She was captivated by the teaching that her parents could choose to follow Jesus Christ after death and accept baptism performed on their behalf in holy places called temples. She and her family were converted to the Savior and baptized. Her family worked hard and began to prosper, adding three more children. They were faithful and active in the church. Then unexpectedly, her husband suffered a stroke and died, compelling her to work long hours at multiple jobs for many years to provide for her five children. Some people in her neighborhood and family criticized her. They blamed her troubles on her decision to join a Christian church. Undeterred by profound tragedy and harsh criticism, she held on to her faith in Jesus Christ, determined to press forward, trusting that God knew her and that brighter days were ahead. A few years following her husband's untimely death, the mission president of Japan felt inspired to encourage the Japanese members to work toward attending the temple. The mission president was an American veteran of the Battle of Okinawa, in which this Okinawan sister and her family had suffered so much. Nonetheless, the humble sister said of him, he was then one of our hated enemies, but now he was here with the gospel of love and peace. This to me was a miracle. Upon hearing the mission president's message, the widowed sister desired to be sealed to her family in the temple someday. However, it was impossible for her due to financial constraints and language barriers. Then several innovative solutions emerged. The cost could be reduced by half if members in Japan chartered an entire plane to fly to Hawaii in the off season. Members also recorded and sold vinyl records entitled Japanese Saints Sing. Some members even sold homes, others quit their jobs to make the trip. The challenge for members was that 
uh, temple prep, the temple presentation was not available in Japanese. Church leaders called Japan, a Japanese brother to travel to the Hawaiian temple to translate the endowment ceremony. He was the first Japanese convert after the war, having been taught and baptized by faithful American soldiers. When the endowed Japanese members living in Hawaii first heard the translation, they wept. One member recorded, we've been to the temple many, many times. We've heard the ceremonies in English, but we have never felt the spirit of temple work as we feel it now hearing it in our own native tongue. Later that same year, 161 adults and children embarked from Tokyo to make their way to the Hawaii temple. One Japanese brother reflected on the journey. I looked out the window of the airplane and saw Pearl Harbor and remembered what our country had done to these people on December 7th, 1941. I feared in my heart, will they accept us? But to my surprise, they showed greater love and kindness than I have ever seen in my life. Upon arrival, the Hawaiian members welcomed the Japanese saints with countless strands of flower lays while exchanging hugs and kisses on the cheeks, a very foreign custom in Jap Japanese culture. After spending 10 transformative days in Hawaii, the Japanese saints bid their farewells to the melody of Aloha Oi, sung by the Hawaiian saints. The second temple trip organized for Japanese members included the widowed Okinawan sister. She made the 10,000 mile journey thanks to a generous gift from missionaries who had served in her branch and had eaten many meals at her table. While in the temple, she shed, shed tears of joy as she acted as a proxy for her mother's baptism and was sealed to her deceased husband. Temple excursions from Japan to Hawaii continued regularly until the Tokyo Temp uh, Japan Temple was dedicated in 1980, becoming the 18th temple in operation. In November of this year, 100 and, uh, the 186th temple will be dedicated in Okinawa, Japan. It is located not far from the cave in central Okinawa where this woman and her family sheltered. Though I never met this wonderful sister from Okinawa, her legacy lives on through her faithful posterity, many of whom I know and love. My father, a World War II veteran of the Pacific, was thrilled when I received my call to serve in Japan as a young missionary. I arrived in Japan shortly after the Tokyo Temple was dedicated and saw firsthand their love for the temple. Temple covenants are gifts from our Heavenly Father to the faithful followers of His Son, Jesus Christ. Through the temple, our Heavenly Father binds individuals and families to the Savior and to each other. President Russell M. Nelson declared last year, each person who makes covenants in baptismal fonts and in temples and keeps them has increased access to the power of Jesus Christ the reward for keeping covenants with God is heavenly power, power that strengthens us to withstand our trials, temptations, and heartaches better. This eases our way. Through temple blessings, the Savior heals individuals, families, and nations, even those that once stood as bitter enemies. The resurrected Lord declared to a conflict-ridden society, to those who honor my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. I am grateful to witness the ongoing fulfillment of the Lord's promise that the time shall come when the knowledge of a Savior shall spread throughout every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, including to those upon the isles of the sea. I testify of the Savior Jesus Christ and of his prophet, and apostles in these latter days. I solemnly bear witness of the heavenly power to bind in heaven what is bound on earth. This is the Savior's work, and temples are his holy house. With unwavering conviction, I declare these truths in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. As directed, the congregation will join the choir in singing 
Rejoice, the Lord is King. We will then hear from Elder Garrett W. Gong of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elder Christophe G. Giraud Carrier of the Seventy. This is the Sunday afternoon session of the 193rd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Our primary children sing, Love is Spoken Here. I once gave Sister Gong a small locket. I had it inscribed dot, 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 dash. Those familiar with Morse code will recognize the letters I, I, U. But I included a second code. In Mandarin Chinese, I means love. So double decoded, the message was, I love you. Susan, sweetheart, I, I, you. <laughs> we speak love in many languages. I am told the human family speaks 7,168 living languages. In the church, we speak 575 documented primary languages with many dialects. We also communicate intent, inflection, and emotion through art, music, dance, logical symbols, inter- and interpersonal expression. Today, let us speak of three languages of gospel love, the language of warmth and reverence, the language of service and sacrifice, and the language of covenant belonging. First, the language of warmth and reverence. With warmth and reverence, Sister Gong asked children and youth, how do you know your parents and families love you? In Guatemala, children say, my parents work hard to feed our family. In North America, children say, 
My parents read stories and tuck me into bed at night. In the Holy Land, children say, my parents keep me safe. In Ghana, West Africa, children say, my parents help me with my children and youth goals. One child said, even though she's very tired, after working all day, my mother comes outside to play with me. Her mother cried when she heard her daily sacrifice this matter. A young woman said, even though my mother and I sometimes disagree, I trust my mother. Her mother cried too. Sometimes we need to know love spoken here as heard and appreciated here. With warmth and reverence, our sacrament and other meetings focus on Jesus Christ. We speak reverently of the atonement of Jesus Christ, personal and real, not only of atonement in the abstract. We call Jesus Christ restored church in his name, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We use reverent prayer language when we address Heavenly Father and warm respect when we speak with each other. As we recognize Jesus Christ at the heart of temple covenants, we refer less to going to the temple and more to coming to Jesus Christ in the house of the Lord. Each covenant whispers, love is spoken here. New members say church vocabulary often requires decoding. We chuckle at the thought that steakhouse could mean a nice beef dinner. Ward building could indicate a hospital. Opening exercises could invite us to do head, shoulders, knees, and toes in the church parking lot. But please, let us be understanding and kind as we learn new languages of love together. New at church, a convert was told her skirts were too short. Instead of taking offense, she replied in effect, my heart is converted. Please be patient as my skirts catch up. <laughs> the words we use can draw us closer or distance us from other Christians and friends. Sometimes we speak of missionary work, temple work, humanitarian and welfare work in ways that may cause others to think we believe we work on our own. Let us always speak with warm and reverent gratitude for God's work and glory and the mercy, merits, and grace of Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice. Second, the gospel language of service and sacrifice. As we gather again at church each week to honor and rejoice in the Sabbath day, we can express our sacramental covenant commitment to Jesus Christ and each other through our church callings, fellowship, sociality, and service. When I ask local church leaders what concerns them, both brothers and sisters say, some of our members are not accepting church calls. Calls to serve the Lord and each other in his church give opportunity to increase in compassion, capacity, and humility. As we're set apart, we can receive the Lord's inspiration to lift and strengthen others and ourselves. Of course, the changing circumstances and seasons of our lives may affect our ability to serve, but hopefully never our desire. With King Benjamin, we say, if I had, I would give and offer all we can. Stake and ward leaders, let's do our part as we call and release brothers and sisters to serve in the Lord's church. Let's please do so with dignity and inspiration help each feel appreciated and that they can be successful. Please counsel with and listen to sister leaders. May we remember as President J. Reuben Clark taught, in the Lord's church we serve where called, which place one neither seeks nor declines. When Sister Gong and I were married, Elder David B. Haight counseled, always hold a calling in the church, especially when life is busy, he said, you need to feel the Lord's love for those you serve and for you as you serve. I promise that love is spoken here, there, and everywhere as we answer yes to church leaders
to serve the Lord in his church by his spirit and our covenants. The Lord's restored church can be an incubator for a Zion community as we worship, serve, enjoy, and learn his love together, we anchor each other in his gospel. We may disagree politically or on social issues, but find harmony as we sing together in the ward choir. We nurture connection and fight isolation as we regularly minister with our hearts in each other's homes and neighborhoods doing member visits with stake presidents, I feel their deep love for members in every circumstance. As we drove past member homes in his stake, one stake president noted that whether we live in a home with a swimming pool or a home with a dirt floor, church service is a privilege that often includes sacrifice. Yet he wisely noticed, when we serve and sacrifice in the gospel together, we find fewer faults and greater peace. When we let him, Jesus Christ helps us speak his love here. This summer, our family met wonderful church members and friends in Loughborough and Oxford, England. These meaningful gatherings reminded me how ward social and service activities can build new and enduring gospel bonds. For some time, I have felt that in many places in the church, a few more ward activities, of course planned and implemented with gospel purpose, could knit us together with even greater belonging and unity. One inspired ward activities chair and committee nurtures individuals and a community of saints. Their well-planned activities help everybody feel valued, included, and invited to play a needed role. Such activities bridge ages and backgrounds, create lasting memories, and can be carried out with little or no cost. Enjoyable gospel activities also invite neighbors and friends. Sociality and service often go together. Young adults know if you really want to get to know someone, then paint side by side on a ladder in a service project. Of course, no individual and no family is perfect. We all need help better to speak love here. Perfect love casts us out fear. Faith, service, and sacrifice draw us beyond ourselves, closer to our Savior. The more compassionate, faithful, and selfless our service and sacrifice are in Him, the more we may begin to fathom Jesus Christ's atoning compassion and grace for us. And that brings us to the language, the gospel language of covenant belonging. We live in a self-centered world. So much is I choose me. It is if we believe we know best our own self-interest and how to pursue it. But ultimately, it's not true. Jesus Christ personifies this powerful, ageless truth. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man or woman profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Jesus Christ offers a better way. Relationships founded on divine covenant, stronger than the cords of death. Covenant belonging with God and each other can heal and sanctify our most cherished relationships. In truth, he knows us better and loves us more than we know or love ourselves. In truth, when we covenant all we are, we can become more than we are. God's power and wisdom can bless us with every good gift in his time and way. Generative artificial intelligence AI has made great strides in language translation. Long gone are the days when a computer might translate the idiomatic phrase, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, as the wine is good, but the meat is spoiled. <laughs> Interestingly, 
repeating extensive examples of a language teaches a computer a language more effectively than does teaching a computer the rules of grammar. Similarly, our own direct repeated experiences may be our best spiritual way to learn the gospel languages of warmth and reverence, service and sacrifice, and covenant belonging. So where and how does Jesus Christ speak to you in love? Where and how do you hear his love spoken here? May we each learn to speak and hear his voice here in our hearts and homes and in our gospel callings, activities, ministering, and service. In God's plan, we will each transition one day from this life into the next life. When we meet the Lord, I imagine him saying with words of instruction and promise, my love is spoken here. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. Do you recall the experience the prophet Samuel had when the Lord sent him to Jesse's house to anoint the new king of Israel? Samuel saw Eliab, Jesse's firstborn. Eliab, it seems, was tall and had the appearance of a leader. Samuel saw that and jumped to a conclusion. It turned out to be the wrong conclusion, and the Lord taught Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, for man looketh on the outward appearance but the Lord looketh on the heart. Do you recall the experience the disciple Ananias had when the Lord sent him to bless Saul? Saul's reputation had preceded him, and Ananias had heard about Saul and his cruel, relentless persecution of the saints. Ananias heard and jumped to a conclusion that perhaps he should not minister to Saul. It turned out to be the wrong conclusion, and the Lord taught Ananias, he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. What was the trouble with Samuel and Ananias in these two instances? They saw with their eyes and heard with their ears, and as a result, they passed judgment on others based on appearance and hearsay. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw the woman taken in adultery, what did they see? A depraved woman, a sinner worthy of death. When Jesus saw her, what did he see? A woman who had temporarily succumbed to the weakness of the flesh, but could be reclaimed through repentance and his atonement. When people saw the centurion whose servant was sick with palsy, what did they see? Perhaps they saw an intruder, a foreigner, one to be despised. When Jesus saw him, what did he see? A man concerned for the welfare of a member of his household who sought the Lord in candor and faith. When people saw the woman with an issue of blood, what did they see? Perhaps an unclean woman, an outcast to be shunned. When Jesus saw her, what did he see? A sickly woman, lonely and alienated due to circumstances she did not control, who hoped to be healed and to belong again. In every case, the Lord saw these individuals for who they were and accordingly ministered to each one. As Nephi and his brother Jacob declared, he inviteth them all to come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, and he remembereth the heathen, and all are alike unto God. The one being is as precious in his sight as the other. May we likewise not let our eyes, our ears, or our fears mislead us, but open our hearts and minds and minister freely to those around us as he did. Some years ago, my wife Isabel received an unusual ministering assignment. She was asked to visit an elderly widow in our ward, a sister with health challenges and whose loneliness had brought bitterness into her life. Her curtains were drawn. Her apartment was stuffy. She did not want to be visited and made it clear that there is nothing I can do for anyone. Undeterred, Isabel responded, yes, there is. You can do something for us by allowing us to come and visit you. And so Isabel went faithfully. Some time later, this good sister had surgery on her feet, which required her bandages to be changed every day, something she could not do for herself. 
For days, Isabel went to our home, washed our feet, and changed our bandages. She never saw ugliness. She never smelled stench. She only ever saw a beautiful daughter of God in need of love and tender care. Over the years, I and countless others have been blessed by Isabel's gift to see as the Lord sees. Whether you are the stake president or the ward greeter, whether you're the king of England or live in a shack, whether you speak our language or a different one, whether you keep all the commandments or struggle with some, she will serve you her very best meal in her very best plates. Economic status, skin color, cultural background, nationality, degree of righteousness, social standing, or any other identifier or label are of no consequence to her. She sees with her heart. She sees the child of God in everyone. President Nelson has taught, the adversary rejoices in labels because they divide us and restrict the way we think about ourselves and each other. How sad it is when we honor labels more than we honor each other. Labels can lead to judging and animosity. Any abuse or prejudice toward another because of nationality, race, sexual orientation, gender, educational degrees, culture, or other significant identifiers is offensive to our maker. French is not who I am. It is where I was born. White is not who I am. It is the color of my skin or lack thereof. Professor is not who I am. It is what I did to support my family. General Authority 70 is not who I am. It is where I serve in the kingdom at this time. First and foremost, as President Nelson reminded us, I am a child of God. So are you, and so are all other people around us. I pray that we may come to a, to a greater appreciation of this wonderful truth. It changes everything. We may have been raised in different cultures. We may come from different socioeconomic circumstances. Our mortal heritage, including our nationality, skin color, food preferences, political orientation, etc., may vary greatly. But we are his children, all of us without exception. We have the same divine origin and the same limitless potential through the grace of Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis put it this way, it is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, art, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Our family has been privileged to live in different countries and cultures. Our children have been blessed to marry within different ethnicities. I have come to realize that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the great equalizer. As we truly embrace it, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. This amazing truth frees us and all labels and distinction that may otherwise afflict us and our relationships to each other are simply swallowed up in Christ. It soon becomes clear that we, as well as others, are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. I recently heard the branch president of one of our multicultural language units refer to this, as Elder Gary W. Gong has done, as covenant belonging. What a beautiful concept. We belong to a group of people who all try to place the Savior and their covenants at the center of their lives and to live the gospel joyfully. Hence, rather than seeing each other through the distorted lens of mortality, the gospel raises our sights and allows us to see each other through the flawless, unchanging lens of our sacred covenants. In so doing, we begin to eliminate our own natural prejudices and biases towards others, which in turn helps them minimize their prejudices and biases towards us in a wonderful virtual cycle. Indeed, we follow our dear prophet's invitation. My dear brothers and sisters, how we treat each other really matters. How we speak to and about others at home, at church, at work, and online really matters. Today, I am asking us to interact with others in a higher, holier way. This afternoon, in the spirit of that invitation, I wish to add my pledge to that of our wonderful primary children. If you don't walk as most people do, some people walk away from you, but I won't, I won't. If you don't talk as most people do, some people talk and laugh at you, but I won't, I won't. I'll walk with you, I'll talk with you, that's how I'll show my love for you. 
Jesus walked away from none. He gave his love to everyone. So I will, I will. I testify that he whom we address as our Father in heaven is indeed our Father, that he loves us, that he knows each of his children intimately, that he cares deeply about each one, and that we are truly all alike unto him. I testify that the way we treat each other is a direct reflection of our understanding of and appreciation for the ultimate sacrifice and atonement of his Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. I pray that, like him, we may love others because that is the right thing to do, not because they're doing the right thing or fitting the right mold. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. At the conclusion of the conference, we express sincere appreciation to all who have worked so diligently to prepare for these services. We thank those who have spoken and those who have provided the uplifting music. The choir will now favor us with Consider the, Lil the Lilies. The concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Following President Nelson's remarks, the choir will close this conference by singing, Teach Me to Walk in the Light. The benediction will then be offered by Sister Kristen M. Yee who serves as second counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency, and the conference will be adjourned.
My dear brothers and sisters, I am deeply grateful to speak with you today. At my age, each new day brings wonderful as well as challenging surprises. Three weeks ago, I injured the muscles of my back. So while I have delivered more than 100 general conference addresses standing, today I thought I would do so sitting. I pray that the Spirit will carry my mes message into your hearts today. I recently celebrated my 99th birthday and thus commenced my 100th year of living. I'm often asked the secret to living so long. A better question would be, what have I learned in nearly a century of living? Time today does not allow me to answer that question fully, but may I share one of the most crucial lessons I have learned? I have learned that Heavenly Father's plan for us is fabulous, that what we do in this life really matters, and that the Savior's atonement is what makes our Father's plan possible. As I have wrestled with the intense pain caused by my recent injury, I have felt even deeper appreciation for Jesus Christ and the incomprehensible gift of his atonement. Think of it. The Savior suffered pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind so that he can comfort us, heal us, rescue us in times of need. Jesus Christ described his experience in Gethsemane and on Calvary. Quote, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore, close quote. My injury has caused me to reflect again and again on the greatness of the Holy One of Israel. During my healing, the Lord has manifested his divine power in peaceful and unmistakable ways. Because of Jesus Christ's infinite atonement, our Heavenly Father's plan is a perfect plan. An understanding of God's fabulous plan takes the mystery out of life and the uncertainty out of our future. It allows each of us to choose how we will live here on earth and where we will live forever. The baseless notion that we should eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die and it shall all be well with us is one of the most absurd lies in the universe. Here's the great news of God's plan. The very things that will make your mortal life the best it can be are exactly the same things that will make your life throughout all eternity the best it can be. Today, to assist you to qualify for the rich blessings Heavenly Father has for you, I invite you to adopt the practice of Thinking celestial. Thinking celestial means being spiritually minded. We learn from the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob that to be spiritually minded is life eternal. Mortality is a master class in learning to choose the things of greatest eternal import. Far too many people live as though this life is all there is. However, your choices today will determine three things 
where you will live throughout all eternity, the kind of body with which you will be resurrected, and those with whom you will live forever. So, think celestial. In my first message as president of the church, I encourage you to begin with the end in mind. This means making the celestial kingdom your eternal goal, and then carefully considering where each of your decisions while here on earth will place you in the next world. The Lord has clearly taught that only men and women who are sealed as husband and wife in the temple and who keep their covenants will be together throughout the eternities. He said, quote, all covenants, contracts, bonds, obligations, oaths, vows, performances, connections, associations, or expectations that are not made and entered into and sealed in the Holy Spirit of promise have an end when men are dead." Close quote. Thus, if we unwisely choose to live celestial laws now, we are choosing to be resurrected with a celestial body. We are choosing not to live with our families forever. So, my dear brothers and sisters, how and where and with whom do you want to live forever? You get to choose. When you make choices, I invite you to take the long view, an eternal view. Put Jesus Christ first, because your eternal life is dependent upon your faith in him and in his atonement. It is also dependent upon your obedience to his laws. Obedience paves the way for a joyful life for you today and a grand eternal reward tomorrow. When you are confronted with a dilemma, think celestial. When tested by temptation, think the celestial. When life or loved ones let you down, think celestial. When someone dies prematurely, think celestial. When someone lingers with a devastating illness, think celestial. When the pressures of life crowd in upon you, think celestial. As you recover from an accident or injury, as I am doing now, think celestial. As you focus on thinking celestial, expect to encounter opposition. Well, decades ago, a professional colleague criticized me for having too much temple in me. And more than one supervisor penalized me because of my faith. I am convinced, however, that thinking celestial enhanced my career. As you think celestial, your heart will gradually change. You'll want to pray more often and more sincerely. Please don't let your prayers sound like a shopping list. The Lord's perspective transcends your mortal wisdom. His response to your prayers may surprise you and will help you to think celestial. Consider the Lord's response to the prophet Joseph Smith when he pleaded for relief in Liberty Jail. The Lord taught the prophet 
that his inhumane treatment would give him experience and be for his good. If thou endure it well, the Lord promised, God shall exalt thee on high. The Lord was teaching Joseph to think celestial and to envision an eternal reward rather than focus on the excruciating difficulties of the day. Our prayers can be and should be living discussions with our Heavenly Father. As you think celestial, you will find yourself avoiding anything that robs you of your agency. Any addiction, be it gaming, gambling, debt, drugs, alcohol, anger, pornography, sex, or even food, offends God. Why? Because your obsession becomes your God. You look to it rather than to him for solace. If you struggle with an addiction, seek the spiritual and professional help you need. Please do not let an obsession rob you of your freedom to follow God's fabulous plan. Thinking celestial will also help you obey the law of chastity. Few things will complicate your life more quickly than violating this divine law. For you who have made covenants with God, immorality is one of the quickest ways to lose your testimony. Many of the adversary's most relentless temptations involve violations of moral purity. The power to create life is the one privilege of godhood that Heavenly Father allows his mortal children to exercise. Thus, God set clear guidelines for the use of this living divine power. Physical intimacy is only for a man and a woman who are married to each other. Much of the world does not believe this, but public opinion is not the arbiter of truth. The Lord has declared that no unchaste person will attain the celestial kingdom. So when you make decisions regarding morality, please think celestial. And if you have been unchaste, I plead with you to repent. Come unto Christ and receive his promise of complete forgiveness as you fully repent of your sins. As you think celestial, you will view trials and opposition in a new light. When someone you love attacks truth, think celestial and don't question your testimony. The Apostle Paul prophesied that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. There is no end to the adversary's deceptions. Please be prepared. Never take counsel from those who do not believe. Seek guidance from voices you can trust, from prophets, seers, and revelators, and from the whisperings of the Holy Ghost, who will show unto you the things what ye should do. Please do the spiritual work to increase your capacity to receive personal revelation. As you think celestial, your faith will increase. 
When I was a young intern, my income was $15 a month. One night, my wife, Dantzel, asked me if I were paying tithing on that meager stipend. I was not. I quickly repented and began paying the additional $1.50 in monthly tithing. Was the church any different because we increased our tithing? Of course not. However, becoming a full tithe payer changed me. That's when I learned that paying tithing is all about faith, not money. As a full tithe payer, the windows of heaven began to open for me. I attribute several subsequent professional opportunities to our faithful payment of tithes. Paying tithing requires faith, and it also builds faith in God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Choosing to live a virtuous life in a sexualized, politicized world builds faith. Spending more time in the temple builds faith. And your service and worship in the temple will help you to think celestial. The temple is a place of revelation. There you are shown how to progress toward a celestial life. There you are drawn closer to the Savior and given greater access to His power. There you're guided in solving the problems in your life, even your most perplexing problems. The ordinances and covenants of the temple are of eternal significance. We continue to build more temples to make these sacred possibilities become a reality in each of your lives. We are grateful to announce our plans to build a temple in each of the following 20 locations. Savai, Samoa, Cancun, Mexico, Piura, Peru, Huancayo, Peru, Viña del Mar, Chile, Goiânia, Brazil, João Pessoa, Brazil, Calabar, Nigeria, Cape Coast, Ghana, Luanda, Angola, Mujimai, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Loag, Philippines, Osaka, Japan, Kahului, Maui, Hawaii, Fairbanks, Alaska, Vancouver, Washington, Colorado Springs, Colorado, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Roanoke, Virginia, and Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. The Lord is directing us to build these temples to help think celestial. God lives. Jesus is the Christ. His church has been restored to bless all of God's children. I so testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our dear, kind, and gracious Heavenly Father, we bow our heads before you this Sabbath day in gratitude in our hearts for the bountiful blessings that have been bestowed upon us through thy Spirit. We are grateful, Father, for living prophets and apostles. We are grateful for the inspired counsel which has come from them. We are thankful, Father, for our loving Savior, Jesus Christ, for his atoning sacrifice and his redeeming and healing power in our lives. We pray, Father, that we may ever think celestial and align our lives in such a way that we might be able to receive all that thou hast in store for us, even eternal life. We love thee, Father. We offer our willing hearts to thee and do so in the name of thy Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the Sunday afternoon session of the 193rd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from leaders of the church. Music was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. <laughs>